In our last study together, we were considering the consequences of the fall, what God did in terms of penalty, what God offered in terms of grace. And we left off in chapter 3, verse 21 of Genesis, where God made a covering, God made an atonement for our first parents as a provisional and temporary way of dealing with their sin. One of our problems is that we are not offended by sin unless it affects us. It may horrify us that God requires the death of an animal or that God requires the death of anyone because of sin. But the reality is that sin is a great offense and affront to a holy God. If we were perfectly holy, as God is perfectly holy, we would understand the horror of sin that we cannot because we are sinners too. We are part of the problem. The fact that we're not shocked and offended by sin is part of the problem. You know, one of the greatest the great bases of all entertainment today, popular entertainment, is adultery. Adultery makes an interesting story. Adultery uh, enhances the entertainment value of a story or, or a film or any work of art, including opera and other media or other cultural art forms which um, have entertainment value. And yet, Adultery is when you come home and find your mother in bed with somebody who's not your father. That's adultery. When you bring it home to your pain, to your suffering, or adultery is when you come home and you find the person that you're married to in bed with somebody else. You see, when when it costs us something, then it becomes offensive. We've got to understand that every act of sin costs God something. Every act of sin is a serious and a painful thing to God. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, somebody had to die. Well, in this case, it was animals to make an atonement for them, to make a covering for them. But those animals could only provide a temporary, a provisional, an intermediate and immediate covering for sin, the ultimate covering for sin, which would mean that no other animal had to be sacrificed, indeed that no one else would ever have to be sacrificed, was the death of God's own Son. Maybe we'll talk about that a little more, but that's the place we came to in chapter 3, verse 21. Now, apart from the curse of the ground, the pain that the woman, the the danger and the difficulty that the woman would encounter in childbirth, the futility that the man would know in work, that work would be hard, he would have to sweat, and that the return for his work would not always be proportional to his effort. In other words, the profit which came from the work would not always be proportional to the effort put forward in the work. This is a part of the curse. This is the difficulty that we find ourselves in, in a fallen world. In addition to that, there was banishment from the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had to leave, and that's the situation that we find being talked about. Now, this this section of Genesis that we're moving into, between the uh, fall of man and the, the call of Abram in chapter 12. Abram is first mentioned at the end of chapter 11. It has some of the strangest things in the Bible in it, some of the most difficult things to understand, some of the hardest things to explain. And one of them is found in the very next verse, in verse 22. Again, it's a verse which speaks of a kind of divine consultation. God is conferring with someone. We can only believe that this is a conference within the community of the Godhead, the community of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which alone is a deep mystery to us. Let me just say at this point that all analogies 
which try to illustrate or explain the Trinity ultimately fail. And they, they may help a little bit, but ultimately we can't push them very far because they only help a little bit. They don't help completely. And the reason for that is that we do learn by analogy. And the way we learn by analogy is we say, well, th this is like that. That's what analogy is. It's a comparison between two things which have similarities or which have correspondences. Well, the problem with analogies of the Trinity is that God is unique. God has no peers. God has no correspondences. In a way, God has no analogy. In the set called deity, there's only one entity, and that's God, the only true God. Now, I think I quoted Spurgeon to you in, in, on our first day together. Spurgeon said, I would not want to believe anything I could completely understand because I would have to conclude that it, it, that it was written by my peers. What he meant by that is, I wouldn't want to believe any claim to deity or any claim to supernatural origin. I would not want to believe any claim that someone was making to be God or that this was written by God if I could completely understand it. Because he said, if I could completely understand it, I would have the suspicion that it was written by someone whose understanding is no greater than my own. So there, there's going to be mystery in this section of Genesis that we study. In Acts 8, when Philip approaches the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch, he asks him, he's reading a fragment of the prophecy of Isaiah, and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how, how can I? I don't have a teacher. I don't have someone to interpret. You know, we have a tendency that if we can't understand something to set it aside. Well, as students, if we can't understand something, that's a signal to keep studying. That shows that we need to keep studying something, not that we need to stop studying something. One reason you're in this room is because you've learned two languages. The first time you heard the language I'm speaking, you didn't understand any of it. But you kept studying. You kept listening. Now, when we open this book, there's so much we don't understand. There's so much that seems strange or bizarre or impossible. But that doesn't mean we set it aside and say, forget it, I can't understand that. When a man learns to play golf and he hits the golf ball, the golf doesn't go, the ball doesn't go far, it doesn't go straight, it doesn't go near the hole. He may miss the ball altogether. But he doesn't say, I can't do this, so he stops. He keeps at it until he can hit it longer or straighter. And that's in a silly thing like golf, which is an expensive waste of time. This is something that rewards us with treasure. It doesn't cost us treasure. So let me just say this about the doctrine of the Trinity, which is one of the greatest mysteries. God is not subject to our mathematics. In our dimension, in our world, one can only be one, and three can only be three. Now, technically, when we speak of the Trinity, we shouldn't say God is three and one, or God is one and three. We should say that God is three in one, and God is one in three. We ought to maintain that distinction when we speak of the Trinity. But in our world, I can only be one, not three, and three can only be three, not one. But God created our dimension. He created our mathematics. Hamlet could only be what, what Shakespeare made him to be because Hamlet was created by Shakespeare. Shakespeare can be and do things that Hamlet cannot be and do because Shakespeare has a measure of freedom that Hamlet does not enjoy. We cannot be three in one or one in three, but God can be and God is. The only God who is, is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who are one God in three persons, hold a conference among the three persons, which is reported in Genesis 1, 
22. Excuse me, Genesis 3:22. Now, um, we're going to see very soon, we're going to see it before the flood, that when the biblical writer speaks of God, he has to speak in human terms. How else can he speak? We don't have any terms that we can talk about God in except for human terms. So it's explained to us in human terms that God says the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. That is, uh, the man now uh, knows a horror of evil through experience, which we know intellectually. But then he says that we cannot let the man take from the tree of life. There are, two, there are two trees in the garden. One is a tree of knowledge which brings death, and the other is the tree of life which brings immortality and which protects from death. Now we ask ourselves these questions. What is this? This sounds like magic. Well, it's not magic. We talked about this before. God has deposited spiritual realities in physical containers, okay? That's what we are. That's what each of you is. Each of you is a spiritual reality which has been deposited in a physical body. One day, the spiritual reality which is you will evacuate your physical body. That's called death. And you will no longer be in that container. Then later, that container will be resurrected and remade. But God also deposited a spiritual reality in two trees in the garden. One was a spiritual reality of death and one was a spiritual reality of life. So because they had taken access of death, they were denied access to life. That's all it means. Now if they had eaten from the tree of life, they would not have died. But this is being because God gave the, that supernatural property to the fruit in that tree. But as a part of the penalty for eating from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from, they were denied the tree of life. Christ is for us a tree of life. If we partake of Christ, then death has nothing to do with us. It's a picture of something, but it's also a reality. It's a physical reality which draws our attention to a spiritual reality, a larger spiritual reality. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, are sent away from the Garden of Eden. Verse 24 says that God drove them out, and He actually set one of the angels um, actually more than one angel, the, the cherubim. The singular is cherub. The plural is cherubim. This is one place we get a hint that there are different kinds of angels. We are told that there are angels. We are told that there is an archangel. What's the archangel's name? Michael. There are two named angels in the 66 books of canonical scripture. The Apocrypha gives us other names. The two named angels in the canonical books are Michael, the archangel, and Gabriel. Many Christians think that Gabriel is also an archangel, but it doesn't say that. It just says his name. Michael is the only one called an archangel, which means a leading angel or a kind of first angel. We're also told about seraphim, like the seraphim who hover in front of the throne of God that we're told about in Isaiah 6. We're also told about elect angels, angels which can never lose their, their holiness. We're also told about fallen angels, angels who did lose their holiness. Now, evidently, they were led by a kind of angel called a cherub, whose name was Lucifer and that angel rebelled. And this other kind of angel called a cherub, one of the cherubim, these angels are stationed before the Garden of Eden. Now we have this word in English called antediluvian. It's a word that nobody ever uses. 
The word antediluvian simply means before the flood. So these are antediluvian realities. Sometimes we hear people who are looking for the Garden of Eden. We can be sure that the Garden of Eden was washed away during the flood. We can be sure that there's no garden anywhere in the world with, an, with angels standing at the entrance guarding it. All of this, all of these arrangements became obsolete after the flood and we're approaching the flood in chapter 7. But here we end chapter 3 in one of the most important and significant chapters in the Bible, the story of the fall and the consequences of the fall. You and I still feel the consequences of the fall. I've been here since Sunday night. I've been in Kursk since Monday morning. Since I've been here, I've learned of the death of a friend, a friend who's younger than me. I've learned that another friend is dying, a friend with stage four cancer. Uh, I've, I've learned of another family with great, great problem, problem with the daughter in America. All these are consequences of the fall, the death that we face, the illness that we face, the difficulty that we face. God has a remedy for the fall. God sends a second Adam to undo the ruin brought on by the first Adam. His name is Jesus, God's own son. But now we move to chapter 4.